Let me first say, I think there's a ton of value in competing in jiu-jitsu. A lot of my most important life lessons I look back on come directly from jiu-jitsu tournaments, and I feel like everyone who spends time training these moves should do at least one tournament in their life and feel what it feels like to use them at 100%, but I don't think regularly competing is for everyone. Now, I don't wanna make anyone consider quitting competing. That's not what I wanna do here. It's more so to ask yourself why. Why are you competing? Why are you doing this? Why are you beating your body up for this sport? And for me, my why was very shallow. It was, I wanted to be the best. And when that falls short, you're kind of left with nothing. So my hope here is that we can find some more nuanced whys for you guys. Now, like I said, my why is a shallow why. It was just, I wanted to be the best. And thanks to Flow Grappling, I can relive the moment where I realized I was never gonna be the best over and over and over again. And it, uh, it looked a little bit like this. Now, you might be saying, Tyson, you lost to the Pan Am's champ and quit jiu-jitsu? No. Well, yes, but not right here. So let me paint this picture for you. We're in the quarterfinals. We're already on the podium. I lose to Mateus in all of 18 seconds. This is probably the fastest I've ever lost in jiu-jitsu. And I go to the back to eat away my feelings. I have a Cinnabon from a gas station that I picked up on the way to Pan Am's. So I'm halfway through this Cinnabon and I hear them call me back out for the finals. So I start walking out for the finals and then I see Mateus pass me and he's pissed as fuck. So I keep walking, see Cole Franson on the mat and him and I were supposed to be sharing third. We'd already lost, both of us. And they're telling me that Mateus and his opponent got double disqualified in the finals. So now it's on Cole and I to fight for first and third. Now for the people that don't know, jiu-jitsu tournaments are single round elimination. You get one shot, if you mess up, you're out. So getting a second shot at the finals is like a once in a lifetime opportunity. This doesn't happen to anyone. So here I am thinking the universe is finally coming together, giving me this Pan Am's title that I've been waiting for. And I think you guys can see where this is going. In order to counterbalance some of the shame that I'm putting myself through making this video, we're gonna go through some of the matches I had leading up to the finals. That way I can break down the mindset that I had when we got there. But I wanna be clear, I don't wanna make this channel about me. The reason I started this channel is to highlight the athletes that I've studied over the years and show you guys why I think they're so great. Now, I couldn't have had a more perfect start to the day. Usually going into these major tournaments, I like to get a quick submission early on because it really helps with that adrenaline dump. Sometimes if you go into your first match with all that adrenaline and it ends up being a real battle, you use way more energy than you need to. So a quick submission kind of gets you in and out. It's kind of one of those things where you don't want to go into your first match assuming you're going to get a quick submission, but it can help you set the rest of your day up if you're able to. Now, big tip for this type of calf crank I'm doing right here, pull down on the toes. You can see instantly, as soon as I switch to the toes, the calf crank goes on and I spend a lot more energy pulling on his ankle than I needed to. It might look like I'm checking in with my team here. Realistically, I'm looking for whoever's holding my food because I'm starving at this point. And don't think I'm making an excuse for my loss later. I absolutely hate it when people use their weight cut as an excuse for the loss. Like we all cut weight, we all felt like shit. You don't get to use that as an excuse. The only reason I bring that up is so you understand why I look like the goddamn castaway in my third match. Going into my second match, I was fighting a really tough competitor, Damian Orende. He competes all the time, so I know he's really strategic and I know I was gonna have to be strategic in order to beat him. Right off the bat, I made a big mistake. It's clear watching the video that I pulled first, but I wasn't aware of it at the time. So if I would have come up right there, I would have gotten two points, but instead I got a little greedy and I went for a Barambolo, which got me stuck in 50-50. And in a strategic match like this, where there's no points on the board, getting stuck in 50-50 could be the end of your day. You're gonna see us roll out of bounds with toe holds, and I wanna explain this for the people that see this happen in tournaments all the time, but they don't really understand why. So in jiu-jitsu, if someone rolls out of bounds with a submission, they can't reset you in the submission. So they have to give the person who had it two points and then restart you on the feet. So people will use this to play the rules. They'll grab a toe hold on someone and they'll purposefully roll them out of bounds in order to score that two points on them. The way you counter this is by grabbing a toe hold on them so that they have to score the two points on both sides and you stay tied. As I'm coming back to the mat, you can see me looking over toward my coach and nodding. My coach has hand signals that he would give us, and he was giving me the signal to try to time my opponent's guard pull and shoot and take him down. Now you can use this if you know your opponent's going to pull guard. The idea is you're going to shoot before you engage, and if you're the one initiating the shot before he sits down, you should get the points for it. And I don't get to say this much, but the ref I had all day was on point. He had some tough calls to make, including this one. This is a really like split second timing thing to make the call on. And he was right on every single one, even rewatching a lot of the, the timing things. And that's pretty much the deciding factor in the match. At this point, I'm up on points. I'm just waiting for the clock to run out so I can move on to the next match. And before you run to the comments section and say, oh, Tyson, you just stalled out that whole win. I did stall out that win. I did, and I'm gonna do it again. 
There's this bout of brain rot that's infected the jiu-jitsu community into thinking that a competitor winning the match up on points should still be moving and changing positions. Like you're up on points, win the match. You wouldn't think like this in any other sport. People wanna see you win. People don't wanna see you make your loss look really cool. And if you struggle with that mindset, cause I know I did, I used to feel like I needed to make every match exciting. Remember who you're trying to impress. Are you trying to impress the crowd who doesn't really care about you and they're just trying to see some chaos that they paid for? Or are you trying to impress the other competitors who understand what's going on and understand why you're stalling? Speaking of stalling, let's get into my third match of the day. With my opponent here, I had watched some of his matches previously in the day and I knew he was gonna pull guard here. So the game plan was to pull guard with him and come up to take the advantage. In Jiu Jitsu, if you both pull guard at the same time, whoever takes the initiative and gets on top gets one advantage. Now points always trump the advantage. So if he was to sweep me or score points on me after that point, he would be winning. But that advantage means I'm winning until something in the match changes. Now I want to explain this because it looks like stalling and I get that to the crowd and to Lloyd Irvin's entire team that was yelling at the ref to give me stalling penalties this whole match. It looks like stalling. I agree. But let me explain why it's not stalling. So we're in the same position the entire match. We're in half guard the whole match, but there is a battle going on. And you can see a little bit of it from this angle, but it happens the entirety of the match. I'm looking for his collar and he's undoing the collar grip. It's a simple battle, but it's a battle. It's happening and we're not stalling. He's not stalling. I'm not stalling because I'm looking for the grip. He's breaking the grip. So if he wants to keep playing that game, I will ride the eight minute clock out doing that fight the entire match. And that's pretty much what you're going to see here. I'm not going to bore you guys to death with this match. We're going to see the same thing through the entirety of the match, like I said before. So we'll just jump straight to the end to the last little 30 seconds. If you really want to watch the whole matches, I'll put links to them in the description. In this last 30 seconds, I would not have been surprised if I got a stalling penalty. I was stalling here. And the thing to keep in mind is stalling itself is not illegal in jiu-jitsu. The time you stall is what's illegal, right? So as long as you're stalling for a short amount of time, that's normal and that is a part of jiu-jitsu. I can clearly see that my opponent thinks he should have gotten points for something, but it's confusing to me because I have no idea where he thinks points should have come in this match. I don't know, maybe he's just confused that I didn't get stalling penalties that entire time. Now, following this match was when I lost to Mateus Gabriel in the quarterfinals, and you know, we don't need to see that again. On to the finals. Well, the second finals of our division. So I'm fighting Cole Franson in the finals, and I know he's a good competitor. I've shared the podium with him a bunch of times, and I know his guard game is a, a similar one to my own. We play a lot of Baron Bolos, and he's got a really dynamic guard. So the game plan for Colt was to take the guard from him. And where that's a little different than the last match I had, we're both going to sit at the same time. But the difference is I don't really want to be passing Colt's guard. So I'm not going to come up and take the advantage. I'm going to kind of leave that for my opponent to do because I trust more that I'm going to sweep him rather than pass his guard. Sometimes in this scenario, both people won't come up. In that case, both people will get a penalty and they start him back on the feet. The first penalty is just a penalty. The second penalty, your opponent gets an advantage. Third penalty, your opponent gets two points. The last one, you're disqualified. That scenario is exactly how Mateus Gabriel and his opponent got double disqualified in the finals. Where the game plan will change a lot is when your opponent already has a penalty. Because in that case, when you sit down, you're both getting a penalty. But if they already have one, their second penalty is going to give you an advantage. Their third penalty is going to give you two points. So you can play the penalty game with them if they already have one and you're doing this double pull game. So now I shoot this triangle, it's fully locked in. I think I have the match in the bag, but I don't know if you've ever tried to triangle a rooster weight. Sometimes they have like no shoulders to grab on and they're able to just slide their head out of the triangle. That is exactly what happened with Cole. He just slipped his head right out instantly. We trade advantages here. I get an advantage for the triangle attempt. He gets an advantage for the knee bar attempt right after. So he's still in the lead on me. One of the biggest mistakes I think I made with this match was not focusing enough on the position. I was too focused on getting a submission. And at the time I truly believed I was gonna finish a submission at some point in this match. But if you put all your eggs in that basket and you're down on points, you don't get the submission, you lose the match. It's better to get a little lead on your opponent and then it kind of puts them on the back foot and opens up more submissions along the way too. Cole does a really slick back take here and I just want to say that I actually think the ref made a mistake here. I think that Cole should have gotten my back. He put both hooks in, it was clear. I jumped out of bounds on purpose, so I probably should have got a penalty for that. You might look at the end of the match and say like, oh, that was a close match, but I actually don't think it should have been. I think Cole should have beaten me by at least four points because of this scenario. Again, we have the double guard pull, and with this scenario, you never want to just come up into someone's guard. You always want to come up with a move in mind. You want to come up with a leg drag. You want to come up with a guard pass. You want to try to bear bolo from your double pull. But if you just come up into their guard, sure, you get the advantage, but you're coming up in a position where they can sweep you from really easily. And if they sweep you, that advantage doesn't matter anymore. And please, for the love of God, learn from my mistakes. Position before submission. I had a perfect Baron Bolo here, good back take, the grip all the way around the back to the other hip, everything I need to take the back, and I went for that calf crank. 
I had more confidence in the calf crank because I hit it earlier in the day, but I should have just went for the back right here. The calf crank seems like one of those moves that there's a certain portion of the jiu-jitsu competitors that will just never tap to it. There's certain guys you can literally touch their heel all the way down to their butt. That's what happened here. And they still won't tap to it. So I think it's one of those moves where if it's not working, try to recognize that pretty quickly and move on to something else before you burn too much energy. Rewatching that, there's not even a wince. He doesn't look phased at all by it. I don't think he ever even thought about tapping to that calf crank. Honestly, part of me was hoping we would get a reset on the edge of the mat here and I would get two points for the submission that I had when we got reset, but the way it played out is how a ref should let it play out. They should let the scenario end if they can and then reset you. So we double pull again and this time you'll notice that I come up to take the advantage so I can tie the score up. And let this be a lesson in trusting your game plan. You make your game plan the way you do for a reason. You need to believe in it, right? If you only stick to your game plan half the match, it's pretty useless. You have to ride out the game plan, trust the game plan. Sure, there's times to call an audible and do something different, but 90% of the time, straying from your game plan is going to make you lose the match. The way Cole's off balancing me here is really good too. A lot of people kind of miss this stuff, but he's constantly off balancing me left, right, left, right, and he's never letting me get my balance. The moment where I get my balance, that's when I'm going to start to undo some of his guard. So he's never giving me that opportunity. He's shifting my weight every time I try to regain my balance. And then when he finds an angle to get up, so he shifts my weight over to the right, he's going to have an angle to get up on the left. If he shifts my weight to the left, he's going to have an angle to get up on the right. And that's exactly what he uses to stand up here. So we get reset back to the middle and you're going to see me try a roulette sweep and chain it to an arm bar. Now, I think the roulette sweep deserves its own video, but the gist of it is you're going to control both of your opponent's sleeves. When they stand up, you open your closed guard and you try to swing your hips underneath in between their legs. When you have your hips underneath their legs, you're able to kind of press up and throw them over the top of your head. Now, some people will land on their head here because they don't have their hands to control. Some people do it on purpose to not get swept and some people just do it on accident. I've seen my coach knock out a couple people with the sweep. And as you can see, Cole lands on his face right here, but he's still able to maintain top position. So we get a reset back to the middle. And at this point, I've just completely forgotten about my game plan like it didn't exist at all. And I just accept top position. The rest of the match looks pretty similar. I'm unsuccessfully trying to pass his guard. Cole's maintaining a good guard until the clock runs out and he ends up being the 2018 pants champ while I am alone on third place. Just look at this goddamn mess of a podium. To wrap this whole thing up, I'm not trying to say that if you lose a jiu-jitsu tournament, you should quit. That's not the point that I'm trying to make. It's that you should find the avenues of jiu-jitsu that are the most valuable to you. Jiu-jitsu needs everything. It doesn't just need good competitors. Jiu-jitsu needs good coaches. Jiu-jitsu needs photographers. Jiu-jitsu needs fans. It needs people doing these breakdowns online. It needs everything to make the community. It doesn't just need good competitors. So you don't have to be that. You can find an avenue that you like in jiu-jitsu and you can dive down that path and you can be really useful to the overall growth of the sport. Me personally, I hated every moment of every competition I ever did. The whole reason I competed was to prove myself. And I'll be the first to say that that's a very unfulfilling avenue to take. I know, that was a long one. Thank you guys for letting me vent about my failed jiu-jitsu career. If you're still here at this point and you like the video, like it. If you didn't, don't. I'll see you guys on the next one.